I, I want to touch on a couple of points that really have not been addressed on the floor uh, today. One is the impact that an amendment like this would have on our business and economic climate. Uh, General Mills, a Fortune 500 company, is in my legislative district. They have a domestic partner benefits. They recruit from around the world to bring the most talented employees to Minnesota to build their company and to provide more jobs for Minnesotans. In fact, many Fortune 500 companies have those same kind of benefits. They find it a positive recruiting tool. Our universities are frequently recruiting professors and other star academics. And in the Judiciary Committee, we heard testimony about a star professor that was considering coming to Minnesota, but when he became aware of this controversy in Minnesota, he withdrew his application and went to a different university. This amendment, if passed, would send a strong message and precisely the wrong message to potential employees around the world that Minnesota is not a welcoming place to do business or to work and to bring your families. There is broad scientific support for the proposition that children raised in the same gender couples fare just as well as those raised in different gender couples. So we haven't actually heard much in the way of argument here on the floor today in favor of this amendment. Most of the discussion has been from the members who think this amendment's a bad idea, but we heard a lot in committee about the threats to family and the impact on children. Children ought to be raised in a differently gendered uh, uh, family. But in fact, the scientific research suggests, as uh, Senator Dibble passed out on the floor just moments ago, information regarding this, that they do just fine when they're raised in the same gender couple. And in fact, so that same research finds that the same gender parents are more nurturing than opposite gendered parents and more supportive of diversity in those families. So there are some advantages, uh, no doubt, to the family structure and the strength of the family structure uh, to having uh, same gender couples. I'm not going to touch on the religious issues here except to say that I don't think that we want to go back to the days of Abraham who had multiple wives or the days of stoning as a punishment or to the days of slavery, all of which were religiously sanctioned. We have moved past those days and there are some days that we should move past even in the present. But I do want to turn to some of the questions that have been raised directly on the floor that address representative democracy and the courts. Because that seems to be the main argument that is being promoted here today uh, for uh, this underlying amendment to our Constitution. The suggestion that representative democracy cannot handle these kind of questions within the legislative body. In committee, we were told by the author of this bill that this decision, this issue is so important as essentially to be beyond the capacity or the appropriateness of the Minnesota Senate and the Minnesota House to decide ourselves. It's so important that only an issue of this magnitude should be decided by the people of Minnesota. Well, I ask each and every one of you, who do you represent here today? Is it not the people of Minnesota? Is it not the 75,000 or so people who live in your Senate districts? How did you get here? The people of Minnesota voted for you 
and voted on your election to send you here as their representative. We do not live in a direct democracy, nor do we live under a federal constitution that's a direct democracy. And the founders of our country and the founders of our state set it up this way intentionally. It's because not every member of our Minnesota, the five and a half million or so residents, can come here and day after day after day sit through committees and listen to experts and attempt to become very learned on the topics that we have to cast votes on and to make decisions on. They have their own jobs that they have to do to earn their living, to support their families, to put a roof over their heads and to pay for their food. They have entrusted us with that responsibility to come here to learn in detail about the public policy questions and to render our judgment in consultation and taking into account the views of the people in our districts. They have sent us here to make these decisions. This decision is not so important that we can't handle it. I would suggest to you that there are more important decisions before this body than the decision that's up in Senate File 1308. It's become a tired refrain about around this body, but no less significant that we're spending hours and hours sitting here talking about this issue instead of finding a solution to the $5.1 billion budget deficit and making a decision about the 34 plus billions of dollars that we are supposed to be deciding on to set a budget for state government services for the next biennium. Why aren't our conference committees meeting now? Why aren't budget targets being given to the conference committee so they can actually start making some decisions? A week and a half to go before session adjourns. Why aren't we doing that now? I would argue to you that cutting off the health insurance of children and those who can't afford insurance for their medical needs is a far more important decision for the average Minnesotan than making a decision on a gay marriage amendment. I would argue to you that failing to provide insurance and education and services to our early childhood persons, our tiniest of tots, before they get into the K-12 education system, because we haven't found the way or the resources or whatever it takes to provide those services. That's a far more important decision we make here today than on whether to pass this amendment. I would suggest to you that not providing adequate funding to the K-12 system so that their classrooms are now getting close to 35 persons, that's a far more important decision than deciding on this amendment before us here today. The purpose of representative democracy is to come here and to represent the values and the goals of our constituents. But there was an intentional layer between direct democracy and public policy making. And the layer is us coming here and applying our independent judgment. And it's also a layer that's intended to help protect against whatever the strong political climate may be of the day and to think longer term. In the Senate in particular, where we two out of three uh, elections every decade have four-year terms. It's intended to be that way, so we can think perhaps a little bit more years down the road than is typically considered in an average election in November. I would suggest to you that this bill today is really just a political tactic. It's a tactic to find a way to cement this position into the state constitution. But if it's so important, and I believe that there are times when it's appropriate for the people of Minnesota to make decisions directly, but those times are 
decidedly the exception, not the rule. There have been uh, 304 bills introduced for constitutional amendments in the last 10 years in the Minnesota legislature. Only three of them have passed and gone on to the voters for consideration. But if it's so important that the people make this decision, then we can let them make this decision. But let's give them the right decision to make. There's been a lot of conversation on the floor today. Senator Limmer and Senator Gazelka in particular have articulated why it is we should fear the courts in this area. In various words, Senator Limmer referred to his discomfort of letting them decide, or that this issue would be cheapened by letting the courts decide. He specifically referred to judicial encroachment, that it really is the job of a representational body, not the courts, to make these kinds of decisions. I've already talked about representational body. If, in fact, it is the job of the representational body, that's us. That's us. That's not direct democracy voters in a constitutional amendment in November. He said a small number of judges should not define or even have the opportunity to define marriage. It's not a wild scheme to think that they'll do that. It's another way of saying a term that hasn't been thrown on the floor yet today, but we should not let activist judges make this decision. Well, if that's the case, then it's those activist judges appointed by Governor Pawlenty, who have the majorities on the Minnesota Supreme Court and Court of Appeals, that apparently the majority of this body is afraid of. So I ask, what are we really afraid of? Uh, members, if we are so concerned about the courts wading into this issue, I don't think Massachusetts is a very good example because at least some of those decisions I know were based on their anti-discrimination laws, not on the definition of marriage in Massachusetts. But if, in fact, we want the people to make a decision on this, then I think they ought to be allowed to make the decision that I will present to you in the A5 Amendment. Uh, members, I offer the A5 Amendment.